Welcome to the Veritas Podcast. I'm Scott Veritas, and today I'm joined by a returning guest, Ben Sixsmith, a writer and author whose work has appeared in Quillette, Unheard, The Spectator, The American Conservative, and more. Ben, thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Good to have you back. Thank you for having me, Scott. Yeah, it's good to see you again. I know that uh, this is a good week for me to talk to somebody who's worked in the media. I know you're not a news reporter, but you do do work in the media as a columnist, as a writer, uh, as was mentioned in your bio. And there was a really, really interesting thing that happened, at least in the world of U.S. media. Um, and just a quick note for my my listeners and readers, Ben is coming to us from Poland. And if you want to know more about his background personally, he's been on the show before. And I think we talked about that more in that episode. So I'll link to my first interview in the description down below. But we'll stay away from that today because for any repeat listeners, they'd just be hearing all of that again. But I wanted to ask you, Ben, about what happened at the Washington Post recently. And I'll give a very, very brief overview for listeners who may not be familiar there's this woman named Felicia Sanmez. She's a rep- she was a reporter at the Washington Post, and she uh, took great umbrage with a tweet from one of her colleagues, or a retweet, I think, of a joke that went something to the effect of, all women are bi, you just have to find out if it's sexual or polar, which is a funny little joke, or maybe some people don't find it funny. This woman certainly did not. She took issue with it, made this very publicly known on Twitter, kind of went on a bit of a tirade. The reporter who initially retweeted the joke was suspended for a month without pay. His name is Dave Weigel. And eventually, this was not good enough for Felicia Sanmez, so she kept kind of going on these tirades against her employer on Twitter, against The Post. She started kind of implying or basically straight up saying that there's a sort of patriarchal cabal against women in media. She kept doing this for several days, and eventually she was actually fired from The Washington Post. So kind of a weird thing happened where this guy was initially suspended for this retweet and eventually this woman gets fired. My question for you, Ben, is do you think that this is indicative of an environment at what are supposed to be very prestigious, high-end positions at these like big prestigious newsrooms? I mean, the Post is like the second or third most decorated newsroom in the United States, at least, just behind the Times and maybe one other. Do you think this is indicative of an, of an environment where there's almost a sort of schoolyard or like jungle environment that's creeping up. It seems like there's a level of personal grievance that is disrupting the professional journalistic process that has come up before. Because we saw like Barry Weiss uh, a couple of years ago was bullied out of the New York Times newsroom. This isn't a new phenomenon. This has been happening a lot. What kind of environment is this indicative of at some of the most prestigious newsrooms in the world? Because the Washington Post is not just some rinky-dink paper. Yeah, it's very indicative of an environment where people want to drag others down, especially yeah. if they kind of if they symbolise privilege as uh, a white male journalist must have done. And it's also an indicative of an environment where people want to make a name for themselves. Uh, mm. Taylor Lorenz, who's a fairly recent Washington Post hire, uh, is notorious for elevating herself even above her own stories, and I'm sure that. Other journalists have caught a whiff of this and they're trying to achieve the same result. And I I, I think it's very sad because on the one level, it's great if even the most venerable institutions have like a culture of internal disagreement. Like, I I can't imagine caring about the joke even if you don't find it funny, which I do. But if you do care about it, I don't think there's anything wrong with being like, Hey Dave, I, you know I, I find this joke a bit offensive. Let's talk about it. What, you know, what did you find funny about it? It'd be a very tedious conversation. At least it would be a conversation. But that's not what she did. She didn't just disagree with his retweeting of the joke. She was implying that it was some kind of you know, moral sin, some huge, like hugely professionally irresponsible thing to do, something that really needed professional consequences. No. So, yeah, very, very hostile environment to be with. Yeah, it's there are so this is a really great story that we might end up spending the whole show on it because it there are so many aspects of it that struck me as quite bizarre. You sort of alluded to the fact that the joke isn't even like undeniably offensive. It's actually not that out there or edgy of a joke to begin with, and it's just hard to imagine. I think Felicia Sanmez is like in her late 30s. She's a pretty seasoned professional reporter. She'd been in the industry for a while. Some reporters report from war zones. It's not an easy job. I don't envy news journalists. I was very shocked that she was that she would disparage her employer over this joke and imply that it was in, she seemed to 
do what seems to often happen with people who have a victimhood complex, which is that they imply that a relatively small, let's call it a microaggression, right, to use a term that hasn't been used in maybe a couple of minutes in, in the culture war conversation, they imply that these little microaggressions are indicative of a broader, hostile, oppressive sy system. And that's kind of what she ended up alluding to, is this idea of this sort of patriarchal cabal that is keeping, I mean, to my knowledge, the only potential you know, minority victimhood status she could uh, apply for as woman. I don't know if she's ethnically, maybe she's, she's some ethnic minority as well, but the whole thing just reeks of a sense of victimhood in a person who is what, at least was until a few days ago, very influential and powerful by any reasonable standard. I mean, big newsroom journalists like those who work at the Washington Post, if you were to rank you know, people generally citizens of, of, of the West in terms of influence and power over important conversations. Mainstream news journalists at like the Washington Post would be pretty high up. I, I'm very confused as to where this sense of victimhood came from. And I'm curious if you have any speculation as to how someone in her position could feel this way and could end up pushing it to the point where she actually did lose her job. I think there are two possibilities. I think one is that people are just unhappy and they're looking for a way to explain their unhappiness. I'm sure there are many people, even in very important positions, who just uh, have some kind of dissatisfaction with their work, with their life, and they're kind of lashing out, looking for a way to explain it. You know, it must be the fault of the people around me. And because, uh, you know, grievances related to uh, real or supposed discrimination are such a kind of modish issue of the day, it's just a weapon to reach for. But I think the other possibility is that an accusation of grievance is a way to claim status. I mean, mm. in this situation, uh, Dave Weigel uh, is uh, a better known, probably a better paid, more important journalist than she is. So making such a damaging charge against him is a way to kind of elevate herself to the same status or even higher than someone above her and yeah to improve her own social standing but yeah I, I think there must be some personal level to it as well but as you say she might not have pushed it to the point where she was actually uh fired yeah it, it it's and that is part of what makes this pretty exceptional when you know when barry weiss was bullied out of the new york times newsroom a couple years ago and it's pretty clear that that's what happened she ended up kind of sharing that story um through a, a column that she wrote and it it was pretty horrific, but uh, to my knowledge, none of those people ended up being held responsible. In this case, Felicia Sanmez, it's very it's very odd that uh, the actions taken by the Post were in sequential order. It was Weigel being suspended without pay for a month, and then Felicia Sanmez eventually being fired, which basically says that she kind of got the most that she could possibly expect out of this and just wouldn't stop. And you had Washington Post reporters tweeting at her, at least in, I think I know there was one editor, uh, a more senior editor who tweeted just, please stop. Like, what are you doing? It's, it is particularly bizarre. And your, your point is well taken about how it does sort of reek of a po potentially an attempt to sort of use someone else's status to pull yourself up which is very indicative of what I was referring to before, which is this sort of drama-filled, backstabbing schoolyard environment. It, it reeks of a sort of mean girl uh, aesthetic. Like, it's very odd that people in their late 30s, 40s, and 50s are doing this in what I keep emphasizing is one of the most prestigious journalistic institutions in the world. There are people who would, every journalism student in the world would probably kill for a job at the Washington Post. Um, at least until very recently, until maybe a few days ago. And so I guess another thing that I want to ask you about this, Ben, is how do you think this, how, do you think that these institutions, given what happened to Barry Weiss a couple of years ago, given what happened just a few days ago at the Post, are they in danger of collapsing because of a sort of internal dysfunction? And especially when you couple that with the fact that there have already just been issues with revenue. A lot of these traditional media organizations just aren't making that much money anymore. It seems like there's kind of a two-front war on them right now, and one of the fronts is coming from within. Yeah, absolutely. They gave way too much ground to people who were hostile, not just to enemies of the paper, but to people within the papers who disagreed with them. And again, I mean, it's great for institutions to tolerate internal criticism, 
So there's a very difference between big difference between the kind of criticism where you just want to either discuss it, debate things, maybe compromise, maybe change some things. But there's a, you know an overall collegial atmosphere, and then the kind of criticism which is just kind of toxic bullying or public shaming, which you know the first sign of that in any kind of business should be reason to take disciplinary action if not to fire people as, in this case, Washington Post was eventually forced to do. So having given so much ground to these kind of social justice activists, it's quite difficult now for these institutions to say, okay, you know, here's the line, because the line has been crossed to such a great extent already. But I'm sure there's going to have to be a lot of, a lot of cuts to be made. Uh, potentially, if those cuts are made, the papers will end up doing better from then on, because I'm not sure how much value a lot of these people are having. Uh, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, it's this idea of giving ground, I think, is one that maybe gets left out of the conversation a little bit too much. I mean, if we look back at the past, definitely the past like two or three years, but even really the past like 10 years, there's been an in increasingly a culture, and this, this isn't unique to the media, but the, the news media is certainly a place where it seems to be the most noticeable. Increasingly, there's a culture where there is sort of a protected class of people, anyone that can claim some kind of like minority status or who is a woman. I know women aren't you know, technically minorities, but where they can essentially they were just sort of given a blank check to complain about and fetch about almost anything. I mean, to, just to talk about The New York Times again, because they are the single most prestigious newsroom in the United States. There was an incident uh, during the sort of Black Lives Matter riots of 2020 where an, an op-ed was made by a senator. I'm not sure if you how well you remember this, Ben, but mm -hmm. Senator Tom Cotton here in the States wrote an op-ed about potentially using the Insurrection Act, which had been used as recently as the early 1990s for the L.A. riots. Um, and, that, and that he was implying that he was saying that you could use those to quell these pretty widespread riot, race riots in the United States. This was a mainstream opinion. This was an opinion that I think was actually supported by a small majority, something like 53 percent of the public when it was polled. This caused an internal revolt at The New York Times, a claim that there was violence being committed against all of the black, uh, black and brown, you know, ethnic minority reporters. And eventually, the uh, I think the head of that editorial department ended up resigning or was pressured out. And so what we've seen for several years, as you were saying, is the signal has been sent that this behavior is tolerated and actually will succeed in its goals to God only knows what. I mean, it certainly doesn't you know, improve the quality of the newsroom or the functioning of the newsroom. But that what I, I referred to before the lack of adult supervision, it would seem like there are people that are supposed to control this behavior. And this is why I keep using the word schoolyard, because again, it's, it's the, this idea of this lack of adult supervision. The editors and older reporters that you would want and expect to control this behavior, they are encouraging it and have been for many years, as they did with Tom Cotton's op-ed at the New York Times, as they did when they allowed a major and very popular columnist, Barry Weiss, at the New York Times to be bullied out. I know that people talk often of a sort of generational war that is occurring in these newsrooms where the older reporters are sort of the the little tiny patch of skin of, of sanity that is still holding this this body together but those reporters are aging out and retiring and in some cases just being pushed out by these very sort of neurotic activist types yeah absolutely and that's that's an interesting uh adjective you used at the end i think it's worth adding that writers like other classes of people comedians actors there often is like a high level of neuroticism, of insecurity. I mean, the, the very wish to have a wide audience that speaks in many cases to a certain level of, uh, you know, personal insecurity. And it also speaks to a willingness to be very competitive, but you have to be very competitive mm. to succeed in that kind of environment unless you're you know, a truly exceptional talent. So there are a lot of very neurotic people uh, potentially quite unhappy people competing for space. And the language of social justice has given an opportunity to compete for space in, you know, an especially aggressive, uh, intolerant manner. So it, it's, it, it's something which can exist in any kind of business, but I think it exists in 
the realms of media to an especially on an especially high level. Yeah, it's. The, the, I, I am glad I used the word neurotic, although I'm, it's going to make a lot of people upset. But it certainly wouldn't be the first time I've done that on my show. Uh, it's. It's. Uh, and I think actually neurotic was also the word that James Damore, the Google engineer, had used many many years ago. That's kind of a blast from the past when he did his uh, his report on on all of that. But that's that's sort of neither here nor there. The uh, the the use of that term is important because. It is quite a toxic combination to be a news reporter who is supposed to, theoretically, ideally, present information in a sort of clinical, neutral way so that people can form their own opinions and be informed. To have that combined with a very high degree of neuroticism and and an ease of uh, appealing to one's own negative emotions and desire for approval, that is not a good combination. I mean, the reason that the stereotype of the news reporter used to be, like if you were watching The Simpsons or a sitcom in the 90s, the stereotype of a news reporter would have been this very flat talking, like very emotionless, like welcome to the nightly news. That's still to some extent what people think of, but that doesn't really track with the psychological profile we were building of some of these younger, more neurotic activist types, again, because the ideal of the journalist as the agent of truth is that they are thinking objectively about the facts they want to present to their audience. There's an inherent conflict if they are highly emotional individuals who are seeking approval. And actually, you mentioned someone, you mentioned Taylor Lorenz. She strikes me particularly as, I know much more about her and I've heard much more about her than this Felicia Sanmez woman in recent weeks. And Taylor Lorenz, I think is almost a prime example of somebody who seems to want to be a sort of celebrity journalist, which or, or it's 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 this weird cross between like pop star and journalist yeah, uh, to the point where she's yeah. through there. Like if you go back to the new journalism or Gonzo journalism, you did have these figures like uh, Hunter S. Thompson, like Tom, Wood, that's right, like Terry Southern, who really did put themselves at the center of the story and bring this level of subjectivity to their reporting. And I think it's worth factoring in the kind of the economics of the media now as well. Generally now, there is a kind of movement towards looking at personalities. That's why Substack has taken off mm. on such a high level because people are really drawn to these characters. Like, you know, far fewer people cared about Fox than cared about Matt Iglesias or Ezra Klein. You know, far fewer people cared about The Intercept than cared about Glenn Greenwald. Uh, I suspect fewer people cared about Rolling Stone than cared about Matt Taibbi. So these these kind of very opinionated, at least in some cases, very charismatic people, they are attracting more eyeballs, more attention than kind of dry, at least ostensibly neutral reporters. So I wonder if institutions like the New York Times, like the Washington Post, they're trying, even beyond ideological factors, they're trying to infuse their news reportage with a level of personality that they hope is going to attract people. I can't think of another reason why Miss Lorenz was hired, because obviously that was going to open, you know, a supermarket's worth of cans of worms. So I think uh, as well as this ginormous infusion of progressivism, there is this economic incentive to try and hire and prop up personalities. But the problem with the personality is they might end up lashing you as well as the people you dislike yeah dealing with it's funny because it just reminds me of like the handlers who have to handle the notoriously you know off the rails personalities of like people in hollywood and in the music industry except with journalists you typically wouldn't expect that but uh it is interesting you mentioned all of these i think it actually it makes plenty of sense that people want to receive information whether it's commentary or news reporting from someone that they either relate to or find maybe a little entertaining in some way uh that is just engaging to listen to and not necessarily that sort of flat almost like a simpsons character news reporter type but i think the difference between uh somebody like taylor lorenz and a lot of the people you mentioned is that someone like matt taibbi or glenn greenwald they are popular, at least in part, not so much because they are entertaining figures, but because they are figures that people trust and with good reason, because they've shown that they will play both sides of an issue. I mean, Glenn Greenwald was forever thought to, for a long time, thought to be like a hard left-wing figure who has 
in the eyes of many people, switched sides. I'm not saying that's my opinion of what he's done, but many people would view him as somebody who's at least sort of culturally moved from left to right in the eyes of his, uh, you know, his audience and, and many people who are familiar with him. Uh, many people have had that experience of being thought of as sort of moving from uh, a more sort of left wing uh, uh, aesthetic to this sort of intellectual dark web space or this right, right wing space. There, you could have a million arguments over what to actually call these people ideologically. But the thing is, these people are trusted. There's an element of trust of, I think this person is giving me true information because I know that they're not just playing one side. They don't just sort of pick a side in the culture war and go with that. Whereas Taylor Lorenz clearly there is a sort of, there is a, not all everything Taylor Lorenz does is traditionally woke in the culture war sense, but it all has a sort of subtext of wokeness, a lot of the stuff that she does, based on the people she goes after. That's true. But so I there's, a, wonder, there's a one-sidedness. I wonder if we were on the other side of the political aisle, if we would be a lecturer towards Taylor Lorenz, and we would be saying, oh, you know, you know Glenn Greenwald, obvious, you know, obvious partisan hack. I mean, I agree yeah. with you. But that's not necessarily how her admirers see it. Uh, and on, on the yeah. left, actually, I mean, you, we, we can argue about whether people like Greenwald, like Taibbi, like uh, insert name here, are you know reliable, objective figures. But actually, I do think one difference on the left is the left has a real critique of objectivity. Like may, maybe right wing people don't know how to assess objectivity. I'm sure that's true in many cases. We can all name grifters and hacks on the right where people think they're reliable, and they shouldn't. But I don't think the right has the sense that actually objectivity and neutrality is something to be suspicious of. Whereas on the left, there is uh, a kind of intellectual tradition of saying that nobody is objective, nobody is neutral at all, and maybe nobody should be, because the moral demands that the world makes on us are such that we need to be uh, ideological and partisan. So I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the Taylor Lorenz fan thinks. But I'm sure they at least think she's, uh, you know, a good, a good figure for the cause. Yeah, it's it's a good idea to try and step into the shoes of of someone who appreciates Taylor Lorenz's uh, journalism. It, it's hard for me, but I. I, I mean, look, she, she I, I definitely could get her appeal, at least in terms to, of the fact that she does, um, she very smartly, I mean, I know that she, she has a TikTok account that is actually fairly active. She is able to relate to a younger generation uh, in a way that is kind of interesting and that I think very few reporters can do, although she actually has kept her own age a secret, I think. A very strange thing about Taylor Lorenz is that she won't reveal her age on the internet. It's assumed to be something between like 35 and 38, so I'm not sure if she's in the millennial cohort or not. But your your point is well taken about the fact that I would not leave out of the conversation that obviously there are figures on the right who do have very large audiences who I personally would not call very trustworthy. Somebody like Candace Owens, I do not think is a good source of information. I do not think Sean Hannity is a very good source of information. Um, but these people do have large audiences. But you also mentioned that, yeah, that there is there is something in the modern sort of woke iteration of the left in that philosophy that is hostile to objectivity itself. And I think that is why you see something that is from what I can tell, fairly unique to the left. Like if I were to look at CNN headlines and Fox News headlines, both fairly partisan in my view, there would be a key difference in just how partisan they are. And what that is, is the Fox News headlines, uh, if there was a headline about uh, a comedian whose jokes were found to be offensive, um, I forget the name of the woman, so I'm just gonna call her Jane Smith. It's a, she's a curly haired comedian who did a bit about like shout your abortion years ago. And I'm going to use her as an example of somebody who's offensive to the right. I can't. Oh, Michelle Wolf. That's her name. Michelle Wolf. So Michelle Wolf had din, done a bit years ago that was found by many conservatives to be offensive. She had done co comedy that actually offended conservatives, which is pretty impressive. Which she uh, she had done this bit about you know shouting your abortion, being proud of your abortion. And if you saw a headline about it in Fox News, I, what I bet it would have read is Michelle Wolf uh, criticized for comedy routine considered to be offensive. And it would say considered to be offensive and the word offensive would probably be in quotes and that's what it would say and that is in my view a legitimate way to write a headline because you're putting the word offensive in quotes you're implying that it was found to be offensive that's factual information more or less 
on CNN, what I keep seeing is like Ricky Gervais does transphobic comedy routine or is criticized for offensive comedy routine. And the word offensive or the word transphobic is not in quotes, which is crazy for a news article. That is an insane thing to do. That wasn't really a thing until very recently in an outlet like CNN, at least from what I have seen. And that really strikes me as a sort of a core example. To do that in a headline is a great example of sort of dropping objectivity like a bad habit in a field where objectivity used to be a core principle. One of the favorite Twitter memes on the left is like you'll have a right winger or a left winger and a centrist. And the right winger will say like, we should kill 10 million people. The left winger should, would say, we should kill no people. And the centrist would say, maybe we should kill 5 million. Um, which is, to be fair, quite funny, even if it's detached from reality. But what it's uh, symptomatic of is a sense that the left's principles are so clearly, obviously, inarguably true that even to frame an accusation of transphobia in kind of bloodless terms is to diminish it unacceptably. Mm. Like it, it's a fact. It's not something to be discussed. It's not something to be debated. Uh, which is, to be fair, quite an effective way of doing politics because whoever you disagree with is always on the defense. It's not like you're coming uh, on an equal footing. But obviously, when we find ourselves on the other side of those moral premises, it, it does seem remarkably uh, ideological and uh, dogmatic. Yeah, the the the, the framing of politics by our media in a way where, as you were saying, sort of with that example, there is a good guy and a bad guy, and they're actually declaring which side is which. Most media these days, uh, and I'm talking about big legacy media institutions, most of what you're reading from these institutions, it really just reads kind of like propaganda. I mean, it really seems to heavily imply that the left is the good guys, the right are the bad guys, to the point where you know, I talked about the headline example of putting a word like offensive or transphobic in quotes or saying considered to be, and that that struck me as very odd. I've wondered about where it may go from here uh, in terms of other examples of this. The, the example I want to give is when the portraits of two politicians running against each other are presented, typically, they'll both have sort of the same expression. They'll have like a neutral smiling expression. Uh, and this is because you know, obviously a journalistic institution should not present a significantly less flattering picture of one of the politicians than the other. But I always thought it would be funny if there was a outlet, I always used to think this, it would be funny if there was an outlet like, let's say, CNN that was so biased that they were to show a picture of, let's say, Ron DeSantis, who if you don't know is a big right wing governor here in the States, and then they show a picture of Joe Biden, and Joe Biden is sort of smiling pleasantly, and then Ron DeSantis is like scowling and in black and white, which would just look very funny. But I've wondered if we might reach that point soon, because they're pretty much already there. Like things like that are these little formalities that are still kind of like they'll still show just sort of that pleasant smiling photo for the election results. But I've wondered if that we're eclipsing that soon, because I think we're kind of on the verge of even those very basic formalities of neutrality going away. I think there's because, a, there, because there's, as you said, this uh, assumption of good guy, bad guy. I think there's a Simpsons episode where Homer's running for office against someone else and he gives, he gives them the wrong time or the wrong address to the debate. So what, when they arrive, they're all kind of sweaty and out of breath uh, <laughs> and looking very unappealing. And yeah, I mean, that is, that's politics. And uh, news media is becoming so politicized that they're gonna, they're gonna, they will start reaching for those dirty tricks. Uh, because once you once you give up even the pretense of objectivity of neutrality, you know as as flawed as those concepts obviously are. Once you give up even trying, then yeah, why why not make use of these of these tools? Yeah, it's it's a, a frightening prospect because the the connection between hyperpartisanship. And this phenomenon is pretty easy. It's pretty easy to, to figure out where that correlation is. I mean, it used to be that there was sort of a general consensus created by these institutions, the content of which most people were consuming. Like most people would watch one of the nightly news segments, which would all more or less say the same thing up until, you know, maybe Fox News came into the fray in the early 2000s or, you know, and even then, most of the core information was was typically pretty similar up until really the 2010s but of course people are now 
existing in alternate realities. Like for instance, right now they are they're trying to cover um, these hearings that they're having over the January sixth riots that occurred at the Capitol um, t- towards the tail end of Donald Trump's presidency, and Fox News is not covering it uh, at all in the same way as all of the other news organizations. And you can have a debate about you know what the Democrats are trying to do with these hearings, but there's something frightening about the fact that on one end you have people who seem to think this is the single most important thing in the world and that they should show live unedited footage of these hearings. On the other end you have people saying we're not even going to present the hearings unedited. There's just going to be I think they're doing some commentary on it with some of their, you know, main light, nightly news people or they might just be ignoring it completely. I don't watch a lot of cable news so I can't actually say what they've been doing exactly. But it does have this effect of putting people into completely alternate realities. Uh, and you actually will see a, a pretty terrible consequence of this, which is people will have very basic facts about certain stories incorrect. For instance, during the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, controversy here in the United States, are you, are you familiar with what, ha- what happened with, yeah. W- with Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, you know, a lot of people thought that he had wantonly shot a bunch of unarmed black people in the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is the the basic information is not correct. He was uh, accosted and attacked by three white people who he shot. And that's basic factual information that could not be disputed based on video evidence. And that is the the reason people had those basic facts incorrect was because of this. It's a word that they like to use very much in the media misinformation that was presented. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There is obviously polarization. It's kind of an N word, but it's also a fact. And I think it's been a long time coming. I mean, I remember the kind of fake uh, objectivity, which, to be fair, you could see in Fox News around the time of the noughties. I remember Sean Hannity had a show with Alan Collins, who was a liberal guy. So on the face of it, I mean, you know, it's quite fair. You've got the conservative guy and the liberal guy. But the way it was set up was Sean Hannity was this you know, big, strong, charismatic hard-hitting, loud-voiced conservative. And then Alan Combs, bless him, I think he died now, so rest in peace, but he was just the most meek, mild, softly spoken, watery kind of character that you could possibly mm. imagine. So really, he was set up, set up to lose, set up to be embarrassed. So mm. I, I can see the argument that, well, maybe this whole objectivity thing was fake. Uh, and, and that could be true. But to some extent, it's still a good thing, even if it was improperly maintained. We, we do need to have, as a society, some general acceptance of what the facts are before we can draw our moral premises. So even if it was failing before, that doesn't mean uh, there's not some extent to which it's worth defending. Yeah. Well, and it goes even beyond the news media, this sense of objectivity. It's not, to me, just a journalistic concept. There was also something where uh, major entertainment figures were actually generally discouraged until fairly recently from taking hardline political stances that could offend a significant portion of the population. This has changed completely in the past 10 years. Most entertainment figures essentially ascribe to this ideology left-wing, woke, that's the good guys, right-wing, conservative, that's the bad guys. There are some exceptions. There, There's like a very small list of Republicans in Hollywood uh, that you can find somewhere it fits on an index card. But, uh, you know, the, the, and this, um, I think one of the best examples of this is uh, there are a lot of these sort of, and actually this would be interesting because it kind of uh, gets into the genesis of this phenomenon. The Daily Show with Jon Stewart is something that I have looked back on with a much more negative view uh, with in hindsight than I ever would have in the past. Because he sort of originated this form of entertainment that was essentially selectively editing interviews with figures who were right of center to lampoon them, which was funny. It was very funny when Jon Stewart did it because he had good comedic timing as a talented comic. But it led to this huge genre. Now you have John Oliver doing this. You have Samantha B. John Oliver I find particularly insufferable um, because there's this entire genre of just... Uh, you, you sort of referred to the, that show on Fox, which essentially set up this one guy on the left to just be a straw man. But at least he could make his own arguments. What happens on a show like John Oliver Tonight and uh, what used to happen on The Daily Show is 
there was no control that one side of the debate had at all. It was one side of the debate had all the control. It was John Stewart's show or it's John Oliver's show. And what they do is they essentially, they let the host talk for a little bit and then they sort of create this straw man, like a single sentence describing the view of people who are right of center. And then there's a laugh track. And the psychological effect this has on the audience is to say that you would, it's laughably ridiculous to hold a view other than what the host just said. And psychologically, the impact that that's had is I think it's taken people who used to not even watch that much news, that much news or engage in politics that much. They just wanted to watch these comedy shows. But it's taken even that level of objectivity where you used to watch entertainment just to be entertained, but now it sort of implants an ideology in you through these weird psychological tricks like those laugh tracks. And that's, that's a level of objectivity just in our entertainment that I think the loss of which has been particularly disturbing to see. Because now you see it in like, you watch like, I don't know, I, this might be a little more controversial, but I think when I'm watching a lot of like Marvel movies or Star Wars movies that there's a political subtext. And that's very weird. Yeah, absolutely. And just tangentially, I think uh, The Daily Show was terrible for comedy as well, because comedians started getting this attitude of like, wow, we're like the moral conscience of the nation. We're, we're, we're like modern day philosophy, which uh, in his most, well, his latest and last special, Norm MacDonald quite firmly said, what do you think that says about, you know, actual living philosophers? Uh, and yeah, the self-importance that it bred. I guess the one thing I'd say to be fair to Stuart is, in many ways, the Bush administration, exceptionally stupid. Uh, <laughs> generally, decisions made in the past, you'll find people who are willing to defend them and people who will criticize them. I think you could probably even find people who are prepared to defend the Vietnam War, uh, at least in principle. I can't imagine that you could find people saying that the invasion of Iraq was a great idea unless you launch some kind of major detective operation to hunt it down. Uh, you know, even in the Republican Party, Donald Trump won the election to a large extent by criticizing traditional Republican foreign policy. So the, the, the sheer level of stupidity in Bush era policymaking, which is undeniable, and I, I agree with people on the left entirely, uh, I think it did breed among leftists and liberals the sense, to use their phrase, you know, we're the reality-based community. Uh, we're we're the, the truth-tellers. Uh, we're the people who see through the kind of fanaticism, the propaganda. And this level of complacence set in where they just thought that applied to everything. They did. So it wasn't just a preemptive invasion of... Uh, distant state with no real planning for what comes after it's done. It was like everything on the other side of the political arc is done. And everything on our side is smart. Uh, yeah. So it was it was a, a kind of an understandable response maybe in the beginning, but it set the left and liberals on a really dark path that we're seeing them on now. Yeah, it, to be fair, like you're saying, it's you, you, as a comedian, you are entitled to use what material is there. And if the right during the early aughts was acting considerably more hilariously out of control and just it was just giving you more comedic material because they were doing more ridiculous things. And also the right was largely in power because Bush was reelected uh, for a long time. It's fair to say that you would have more material about that. But what we see now is there is plenty to lampoon on both sides. There's plenty to lampoon and satirize with Trump. Believe me. Although it does get a little tiresome because everyone has done Trump satire to death. There's about 50 million Trump impersonators in the world of comedy right now, some better than others. Um, but the thing is, how many of those Trump impersonators would do an impression of Biden, who is eminently uh, hilarious? Because Biden is seems pretty senile. I know that's a little mean and controversial to say, but he, I think he's having some issues there uh, pushing 80. And it's not just that. There is this entire, entire side of leftist politics these days, the woke side, which is very unpopular and which is seen as ridiculous by the majority of the population. But if you watch something like Saturday Night Live, you'll see very, very hard-hitting uh, impressions and criticisms of Trump in their comedy, which is fine. They're entitled to do that. But whenever there's any comedy about the left, it is very toothless. And it's not that funny. 
which it almost it feels a little unfair that they because there's plenty of very funny satire of what's going on on the left right now one guy that's very funny i'll just recommend to people ryan long does great skits on twitter and youtube about uh things going on on the left he has a great video called um i think it's called like woke people and racist best friends forever um that i recommend you look up something like that but uh there is this this there is an element of comedians are entitled to go where the comedy is but right now there's an entire side of the spectrum that you're not really so ricky gervais of course is allowed to because he's ricky gervais and he's one of the biggest comedians in the world and he's worth a bajillion dollars but if you're not ricky gervais or you're not dave Chappelle, making fun of the trans stuff right now unthinkable it's unthinkable i i have been to many comedy shows in in my home city here and that is one thing that people really have not touched they will make fun of a lot of stuff up there but they're not making fun of that and the strange thing is you can go back to old daily show articles i think i saw on the internet you can find john stewart making some really genuinely quite snide comments about you know men who think they're women or women who think they're men but now i'm sure he'd say you know it's just very obviously true that you know people's identity and their self-definition is what we should accept so e even in people who think this is the right kind of politics there's, there's not even a willingness to say you know but i can kind of see how other people could disagree there's this level to which these beliefs are so sacred that you could never laugh at a joke about your own opinions because it would be like the pope laughing at a joke about jesus coming back to dead uh it's, it's just unacceptable uh so it doesn't make for good politics doesn't make for good comedy it doesn't make for good anything. yeah and it doesn't make for good uh social cohesion like if people can't laugh at their own uh sort of political culture their own side of the political spectrum it leads to a sort of self-seriousness that would prevent them from it, it certainly prevents them from being able to even joke about it amongst each other like people People have a very hard time, it would seem, having political disagreements these days, and I think that these phenomenons are connected. Because as you said, if, if you can't laugh at your own culture and your own views, you get this sense of self-seriousness that would prevent you from, from any level of self-reflection and being able to tolerate that kind of joking around, even in like a social setting. And that's such an important part of social interaction is taking the piss out of each other. It's joking around with each other. But these days, it sort of seems like... I know that w when I was in college, there was very much a culture... Because I was in sort of the left wing... I was in the college Democrats sort of social circle, social milieu, where there were endless... You know, when you would sit around and sort of be taking the piss, it would always be out of like Trump or Mike Pence. Like you wouldn't really joke about each other because you wouldn't want to focus on certain characteristics or things. Uh, if you were in that sort of environment. And it got very old very fast. I mean, this is back in like 2017, like the first year of Trump's presidency. So it just, this whole mentality of declaring one side of the spectrum politically untouchable, the good guys, it just leads to this sort of downgrading of basic social interactions even. Like it trickles all the way down into just, it, it trickles all the way down into dating even. Like you you can't, the, the, the fact that, if for a while I found that if I were, I mean, I'm, I'm happily in a relationship now. My, my girlfriend who lives with me is just in the next room. But back when I was swiping around going on dates, I found that I couldn't talk about certain topics that weren't even necessarily political over dinner with a woman on our first or second date because it would just, it just wasn't possible because of a certain mentality that seems to be building uh, among people who were not particularly political until the last like few years. Yeah, and I wonder if our opinions really are diverging. I mean, certainly in the past, there have been huge divergences of opinion. You could go back to the 1930s and you find, you know, one communist, I'm sure, would be the neighbor of a fascist. So I'm not saying that this is an entirely new thing. But I feel like since the 90s, it's not just the nature of the media. It is the nature of our opinions as well, with uh, this, this tremendous sliding of progressivism towards ever more inclusive uh, understandings of what it means to be a man or a woman or your sexuality or nationality. Uh, and then I, I'm on the right, so I'm not the most objective person in a, you know, in a position to assess that, but maybe on, on the right we've become more entrenched in some of our opinions as well. 
when it comes to immigration, when it comes to uh, various cultural matters. Not necessarily a bad thing, that's another argument to have. I'm not saying this as a criticism, but maybe people really just can't bridge these gaps between each other. If I say the sky is blue and you say the sky is red, no amount of personality is going to lead us to have a fruitful discussion about it. So I, I do worry we're going to have within nations, two separate nations, which is almost like the novel by China Mwaville, where there's one city uh, with two different populations and they both have to ignore each other. Hmm. Yeah, it, it sort of alludes to this idea that's come up a little bit, particularly in the United States, because we have a political geography that is, uh, it's almost drawn directly down the middle of the country horizontally. I mean, you've heard about the North and the South. It's not exactly like that. There are some pockets of like, you know, there's New Mexico and there's the Midwest or whatever. But uh, there have been talks of jo jokes and also pretty serious conversations about a national divorce. What would happen if the country essentially did split in two? Um, and I honestly think that's very unlikely. And what, what I've always said is that the sort of uh, mutual mutual political entrenchment to which you refer, I think it is a real phenomenon to an extent of people on the right are entrenched in their views increasingly over time, people on the left, the same thing. I think it does happen on both sides, but one side has a degree of institutional power, uh, that being the left culturally, they really do control the media, academia, uh, they seem to maybe control the intelligence apparatus in the United States. I know that's a little bit of a controversial statement, but they control the big tech organizations. They, I think because they hold that degree of institutional power, they control you know the entertainment sector. Um, and the right really doesn't have that. The right controls like just the Supreme Court right now in the United States, really, um, which I know is not nothing, but it's, it's not that much at the end of the day compared to all these other institutions. I, I, I feel like a national divorce type situation or a situation where there's sort of a mutual like, well, let's just be apart. Let's just not interact with each other. I think that there's one side that has a bigger stick to swing and isn't going to let that happen. I think that something worse than that could happen uh, where there is this, uh, I think, on a very dark, deep psychological level, one side knows they have the bigger stick to swing and wants to use it, Does is will not be satisfied with this mutual agreement to part ways. The, I mean, to bring the divorce metaphor back into it, it it's the idea that, in, you know, well, and this gets into a controversial area where, as well of, it's the idea that if you have one side in a divorce that has a bigger stick to swing, and you could argue that maybe that's, that is the case because of the way the family court system works, and they want to kind of remove somebody's testicles through their wallet, if you will, uh, and because they're not just satisfied with going their separate ways, they also want to, you know, take a lot on the way out. Uh, that is something that I think is more likely than this sort of mutual agreement to, to part ways. Yeah, I'm no expert on American history, but I gather that in the 1800s you had an exceptionally bloody war over, obviously, over slavery, but also over the idea that uh, the South was going to leave the Union. So, uh, happily, slavery is not the issue now, but still, it's hard to see one side, you know, passively accepting the other one going a separate way, even if, even if that was on the table. Yeah, it's, it's honestly one of the least disturbing, like, I have many different uh, projections of where the next, like, 20 to 25 years in the United States could go. One of the least distressing is the national divorce scenario, like a, a bloodless, like, minimal violence, <laughs> like, national divorce. Not good. Not a good thing that I want to happen. But I think the much more likely scenario is that the side that has the much bigger stick to swing because of cultural power and also uh, power over the, the the future generations. I mean, if you think about where the, the rights power centers, it's amongst older people who are dying, especially in the United States. The left's culture power, cultural center powers, especially when you think about social media, the propaganda that they're able to do on TikTok, the censorship they're able to do on TikTok and Twitter, they are really in control of the future of the younger generations. So. I think it's a very, very one-sided thing, this sort of political entrenchment that we're talking about, because although people are getting more uh, staunch in their views on each side, only one side, I think, can really capitalize on that in any kind of direct conflict. And we see this all the time. Right now in the United States, if you say something 
the rules are not applied equally, it would seem, when it comes to enforcement of the law, enforcement of social media terms of service. Uh, you know, both sides can engage in this hyper-partisan, uh, you know, very nasty behavior, but it seems like only one side is really punished for it, and that's usually people on the right. I mean, it took ages for Louis Farrakhan, who is a notorious left-wing anti-Semite, it took ages for him to get banned from social media, whereas right-wing fingers are banned from social media every day. Yeah, I mean, look how long it took Miss Somers to get fired. I, mean, I suspect most of us, if we, you know, rampaged onto social media and started just slagging off our colleagues and our employees left and right, it would take us the amount of time it takes to drink a cup of tea to get fired. Whereas it took her, you know, repeatedly lambasting her colleagues and embarrassing the institution to face any kind of consequences. So. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's undeniably true. Yeah, I, I, I do remember thinking about um, if I had done what Felicia Sanmez had done, I would not have lasted very long. I mean, the idea that you could openly disparage your employer to that degree, when people are begging you to stop, people above you in the chain of command are begging you publicly to stop, it's unthinkable. And it's very weird that they suspended him and then a few days later fired her. Something about that chain of events has struck me as quite odd. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I've squared exactly what the thought process was. There. I mean, I guess they were trying to say that they wanted to acknowledge that what he had done was offensive, but that she simply wouldn't shut up about it. And it's, it's, it's a very weird thing that that was the series of events. You'd think it would kind of be one or the other. Yeah, I mean, she was attacking other colleagues. Maybe that's, maybe that's what uh, did it. But I think it's worth, I think because Dave Weigel is... I'm, I'm guessing by his status, you know, a rich, successful, powerful guy. And, you know, frank, frankly, this is a bit mean, but knowing what I know of his work, it's hard not to feel just a little bit of schadenfreude in the, uh, the, the social justice bat, as you call it, that's mm. swiped him in passing. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to think of like a month's no paid suspension. As, you know, not, not such a big deal. But I don't know about you. To me, losing a month's income is a really big deal. So if that kind of those kind of consequences are on the table because you retweeted, you know, a mildly sexist, if you want to call it that joke, uh, you're going to lose thousands of dollars. It's just insane. And to most normal people in America, you know, that could be the difference between getting evicted or not, falling behind with your mortgage or not. So it's, it's unacceptable that this, these kind of uh, professional repercussions are going to be faced in something so truly. And I mean, if the left really believed in its premises, which in most cases it doesn't, this should be a huge workers' rights issue. Yeah, and it, it does seem to only go one way, as we were kind of talking about before. Like, had, the, had if you reverse the sexes of the individual involved, it, it becomes hard to imagine it going the same way. Like, if a man took umbrage to a joke about men. I mean, joking about men as a group is a huge part of comedy, especially for female comics. And I'm actually not complaining about that. I don't really take particular offense to jokes about men as a group. There are plenty of things to make fun of. Believe me, ladies, there's plenty of stuff to make fun of us for. Um, but of course, that doesn't work both ways. Like if if Dave Weigel had taken offense to something that Felicia Sanmez had, uh, had tweeted about men being... I don't know, men being a bunch of stupid ape-like perverts who sit around and drink Mountain Dew and play video games and jerk off all day. I don't know. Like that, There's plenty of jokes about that that are out there on Twitter. You can see them every time you're scrolling through your timeline. And some of them are funny. It's hard to imagine that, that a complaint about that would have been taken seriously at all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't prove this 100%, but I suspect you could go to the average female journalist's Twitter page, you could go to the search bar, you could type in men, and you could find all kinds of colorful tweets. You could type in white men and white people, and you could find 10 times worse. I know there was a reporter from the New York Times, I can't remember her name. But she had some tweets about white, white people, that, you know, not, they were verging on not being jokes, if I remember, they were so vitriolic, and that really wasn't a professional issue at all. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I mean, the pendulum. Uh, on this issue only swings one way. 
Yeah, and we see this extended into so many other areas. I mean, the <laughs> the response to politically motivated violence, to bring it you know up a few notches, uh, is very different depending on the side committing it. The I, I'm somebody who does find what happened on January 6, 2021 to be disgraceful, the, the riot that occurred at the Capitol. I think it's absolutely awful. And I do actually think there's a degree of responsibility that the former president holds for what happened. The response to it has seemed a little excessive. I, th there are people who did not actually attack police officers who I know broke into the Capitol who are going to jail for many, many years. Um, and they're in pretty horrific conditions from the little information that has come out of the prison situation for a lot of these people. And I, I only really care about, because look, at the end of the day, they broke the law, they went to jail. I, I can't complain too much. But the thing about it is the response to the riots, which occurred just about six months earlier under the name of Black Lives Matter, just it, it, keeping with this pattern of kind of the double standard, the response to that, which was just as bad, if not worse, the response to that has been very toothless. I mean, there were there were actually mayors and governors across the United States, mostly Democratic, who would, in some cases, they pulled the police, the, the law enforcement out of certain areas. I mean, notoriously, there was the, the Chaz in Seattle. I mean, that was like the epitome where they actually had the police vacate a neighborhood entirely. Uh, and it did result in the deaths of multiple people who died in that zone because of a lack of police and and medical uh, emergency medical access. So the, the, the it, it's just I'm just sort of alluding back to what I was talking about before, which is one side clearly has a bigger stick to swing. So when people have a tendency to often bring up that uh, irrationality and sort of dogmatic thinking goes both ways, and a big part of my ideology and what I talk about on this show is, yes, it does. But at the end of the day, you have to remember who has the bigger stick to swing, because that will sort of decide the result of most of the conflicts that arise in a hyper-partisan environment. And it's something that I pe think people leave out of the conversation, the uh, the sort of uh, the, the centrist space, if the, that does exist, or the sort of intellectual dark web space often likes to sort of, we're playing both sides, both sides can be bad. But the thing I always like to try and introduce into the conversation is, yes, both sides certainly can be wrong and can be bad, but I am always much more concerned with the side that has the power to weaponize their darker nature. Yeah, that's completely true. I mean, there was a major publishing house, I forget which, but they published a book after the riots called In Defense of Looting, which was essentially an apology for the kind of behavior that happened after the killing of George Floyd. And it's impossible to imagine a book being written like in defense of looting the Capitol building. And people can argue about the context, but I mean, the level of property destruction, the you know, physical assaults that happened in both completely indefensible, whatever the context was. Uh, so there is this disparity. And I guess to some extent, it's not worth complaining about because if I say, you know, you have the power and you're being unfair, then the response of people in power is going to be, well, of course they have the power. Uh, if, even if they don't say it, that's kind of implicit. So, uh, in some ways, you have to deal with it or try and get power back for yourself. Uh, and I think when left wing people behave in unacceptable ways, uh, we really do have to go on the attack and not just be like, you know, this is really unfair. What if I did this? Uh, but to, you know, to press them, to publicize uh, these offenses, to, you know, call the editors, to call uh, the, the donors. And not when there's, you know, no kind of fair accusation to be made. I'm certainly not suggesting that people manufacture reasons to complain. If someone has done nothing wrong except disagree with me, I'd never support them being uh, treated in that kind of way. But if somebody has genuinely posted something terrible, which just happens to be, you know, acceptable to people with modish political views, then they have to face the kind of consequences that they would dish out to other people. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I actually like when the show ends with a little bit of a call to action. I, I usually frame it that way. So I think that's a good place for us to maybe start to sign off, Ben, But because uh, I know you, you had an hour today and we're, we're at about an hour. But before we sign off, I wanted to ask if there's anything you want to plug or promote. I think, didn't you have a book of short stories come out fairly recently? Yeah, I did. Thank you. It's uh, called Naughties, 
Uh, it's a book of short stories about uh, the kind of after effects of the decade of the noughties, which is the decade where I grew up. Hopefully, they're quite funny stories, but hopefully they also uh, are quite compelling to read. That's on Amazon if you type in noughties there. I have a substack, bensixsmith.substack.com, or on Twitter, at bb And I don't think I have anything else to share. But uh, if I do, I'll you know, send it over to you. I put this in the box. Yeah, my absolutely. You, you... My, my hats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can find you can find links to everything of Ben's, including his hats and all of his other many many fun items. Uh, I'll definitely be including those in the description below so that you guys can check that stuff out and do check that stuff out, Ben. It's always so, such a pleasure to have you on the show. So I'd love for people to uh, you know go out and follow Ben on Twitter, read his stuff. He's got a lot of good stuff out there. Thanks again for coming on to the show, Ben, and thank you everyone for listening. This is the Veritas Podcast. If you're on iTunes, I want you to leave a five-star review. That really helps get this out to more people. iTunes is obsessed with those star ratings, and if you give me five stars, it really helps more people find the show and listen to the show and get this information out there. If you're on YouTube, like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps me in the algorithm, as I'm sure you know. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time on the Veritas Podcast.